Alright, we just waiting for somebody. Somebody. Hey, mama. I'm waiting for somebody, a special person to come in that I want to chat with about a certain topic. Here she go. Here she go. Keon, I just brought you in. Are you in? What's going on? What's going on, friend? Hey. Hey. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. Oh, they got new filters on Instagram. What is all this popping up? I don't know about any of this stuff. Is it changing I how I look? Yes, it's actually changing your screen. And what? it's changing how it looks. I haven't been on live in so long. But let's get into this because I know you have to go into another meeting. I just came from a meeting. So I wanted to talk about the verdict. How do you feel about the verdict? Did you think that he was going to be convicted or what did you actually think? I can't even see you anymore. So Derek Chauvin, right? Yeah, I um, see you perfectly fine. Yeah, I definitely. Oh, okay, cool, cool. I don't know what my screen is doing, but I'm just going to leave it just like this so I don't mess anything up. But, um, yeah, so I definitely did not think that he was going to be convicted. Really? I didn't think he was going to be found guilty. No, um, I because justice, the justice system does not, usually work in our favor. I mean, we have seen police officers murder black people before and it didn't even go to trial, you know, and they kept their job or, you know, it went to trial and they were found innocent on all counts or maybe they received a lesser charge that was not murder or manslaughter. It had something to do with something else, you know, with the incident. So that's why I didn't believe it. Now, that's not to say that, I mean, we all saw well, I don't know. I don't. I won't say that we all saw it because because it's trauma porn, right? Like a lot of people probably are choosing not to watch the footage. I'm there. I don't watch all footage. This this is the last, besides the most recent incident that happened, the uh, murder of George Floyd was the last video of police footage that I watched where a, a black person was being killed by law enforcement. But anyway, um, you know, we can all see that he killed him. Um, <laughs> but I didn't think that they were going to convict him. No. I'm listening to you. My daughter talking to me at the same time. Oh, yeah. I'm looking at Chris Gates. Chris Gates 58 comment saying it was premeditated. I personally don't think it was premeditated. I actually think it was a power trip. Um, but I honestly knew based on the video he would be convicted. But this is my thing, right? There's so much controversy and talking about people are mad at the police. And certain instances like for the guy Derek I do think he was at fault but in this new case did you get a chance to look at I think her name is Micaiah mm -hmm, Micaiah Bryant okay so in this case this is where I kind of get frustrated with people of color because we protest everything and mm -hmm. yes you know there's some different laws and different things that should come into play but when in that situation I feel like the police officer was definitely doing his job because mm -hmm. I know if that was my daughter in the pink and she was about to be stabbed I would want uh the officer to act so my mm -hmm. thing with with that is when do we protest and when do we not protest because I feel like if you protest for everything you get lost in the real message well, I mean, I think that's a lot to unpack. I think that we should always protest against the murder of Black people. Um, and I think that you and I have different viewpoints of this. So with Micaiah, Micaiah Bryant, I feel that her murder was unjust. Um, and it's a you lot of ways so? we can look at it. Yeah. If she was a 15-year-old Black girl. There's no reason that she should I be think dead. It, okay. Oh, so I think it was unjust in the sense of, I think that, the deadly force shouldn't be the only method of force, right? But mm -hmm. based on his training, based on his training, I think he did what he was trained to do. Now, mm -hmm. this is where I play devil's advocate because I don't feel mm -hmm. like it's the police that we should be targeting. It's the policies, the procedures, and the way they're being trained. That's mm -hmm. my concern. Because well, I, that's the I police. Be that's the police. Think. It's the system. It's the it's systematic racism. It is my whole opinion on that. 
it's the system, but it is the police because they're taught the system and they continue the system going, you know? So I, I do agree with you on that point. So in that situation with Micaiah, what was he supposed to do? I feel like if, mm -hmm. if he shot her, he was wrong. But if he allowed her to stab the other girl, he still would have been wrong. So it was kind of mm -hmm. like he was in a lose-lose situation. So what mm -hmm. do you feel like would have been the best response? Well, I mean, here, here's the thing. We can, I think it's a complicated situation. I'm going to explain first why I think that it was unjust. And then I'll explain how I feel about, you know, the officer responding to the situation, you know? So firstly, Micaiah called the police for help, right? So she, ca she called the police for help. Now this is kind of some background info and I had to go read a couple things, a couple articles to find out exactly what happened because we all know there's like a lot of information Chris, oh, out Chris there is saying about they it. Use the taser. So, well, that's, you know, we, okay, let me answer this question. Let me continue with what I was saying. So she called for help. The reason she called for help is because first of all, Micaiah Bryant was a foster youth. She was in foster care. So we probably have all seen her mother get on and do like a little brief interview about her daughter and how she wants her daughter to be remembered. Micaiah was not living with her daughter. She was in the, I mean, with her mother. She was in the foster care system. The foster care mother was celebrating her birthday. And mm. two of her previous foster care children came in from out of state or out of city to visit her. And when they got there, the foster mother mentioned or they started having a conversation about the house being dirty or the foster children, the previous foster children noticed the house was dirty. And so that's how the argument ensued because they were telling the, the previous foster children who are now adults and out of the system were telling Micaiah, hey, you need to clean up. Our foster mom mm -hmm. doesn't like so a dirty they were house, adults. you need to clean up. The yes, they were adults. Were adult okay. Well, I, didn't know I know there were some teenagers there, but this article that I got this information from that I read is, was saying that they were previous foster care youth and they came to visit her. They were no longer in, in, in the system or in her home, right? And so that's where the argument started. I don't know what Micaiah said back, but obviously there was some kind of discrepancy about cleaning. So they were arguing about chores and they began to fight. Now, nobody, there were several adults there and nobody helped this young girl to the point where she felt that she had to grab a knife to defend herself. Okay, so we don't know, and this is just from things I read. I wasn't there. This is just from what I read from the accounts that were taken from the foster mother being interviewed and all of that stuff, right? So she felt she had to defend herself for whatever reason. Now, in the eyes of the law, okay, if you have a weapon, then you're a threat, okay? We don't have, when an officer shows up to the scene, they often don't have the backstory of what happened. And that is where I feel like this systematic error Okay, there's a systematic error right there because she called for help and she ended up dead because she was being abused, she was being beat up, she was being attacked and they get there and they see her after she's been attacked and she's now trying to defend herself and they get out the car and shoot, okay? So me just as a citizen, as a civilian, I feel like that was an unjust killing of a 15-year-old that was being attacked. The police, police officer that showed up I don't know how much detail that he had. Maybe he just responded to the call, dispatch contacted him and said, hey, report to this address. There's, you know, a report of an incident, of uh, um, an argument between several people, whatever, 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 right? So he shows up, he sees her with a knife in her hand. He sees her lunging at another person. And so he pulls his gun to shoot, okay? So police officers don't have to use the same amount of force that, the assailant is using. They can up the ante, whether that's taser or gun, okay? They can up the ante. So I imagine, and this is not defending the police officer because I wanna say again that my personal opinion is that it was an unjust murder of a young black girl, right? So, you know, he, he arrives, he sees her lunging with a knife at another person, he shoots to stop the threat, okay? That's what happened, just plain and simple in black and white, right? Um, now, that, th again, this is where that systematic miscommunication, that systematic error that I feel like needs to be fixed because police officers are trained to kill. They're trained to, to shoot and stop the threat. They don't have to, if, if you're arguing, 
and you haul off and hit a police officer or hit somebody and cause threat or harm to somebody else, they don't have to say, let me tackle them. Let me taser them. No, they can shoot you and they can kill you. And I feel like that in itself is wrong because they're just another, you know, human being. You know, um, he wasn't being threatened at that time, but his job was to protect and serve. So I'm sure that the defense that they're going to go with is that he was protecting the community, right? He saw somebody being attacked with a knife and he was protecting them. Um, I don't feel good about the murder. I don't feel like that was okay. If that was my child, I'd be pissed off. I'd be mad. I'd be trying to sue right now. I'd be getting Al Sharpton on the phone. I'd be getting Ben Crump on the phone. I'd be getting everybody on the phone. I'd be in all the interviews because you shot my daughter and she was trying to defend herself. So what? She had a knife, right? That's me as a mother, right? That's me as an outsider, you know? But police are trained different, which is why I think that the system itself needs to be changed because let's not forget that police were created when they were created they were slave catchers so again it's rooted in the system it's rooted in the system they were created to catch slaves and when they caught slaves they were killing them on the spot or beating them and bringing them back it wasn't no in between and so we're still there I don't feel like it has changed. A human being is being given the power to take the life of another human being and it does not have to be justified. And that's the problem that I have. And I agree with you. So, but everything you're saying is 100% factual, right? I, I guess I want to talk about too, why do we get, okay. In the George Floyd case, he intentionally was on a power trip and he killed that man unjustified. I don't think you should be able to kill somebody, period, right? However, I just think sometimes, too, we get caught up like, okay, with the Micaiah case, with the police officer. I like the fact that you said he was doing his job. I feel like he was damned if he do, damned if he, he didn't. Because either way it went, he's, people would have still had something negative to say in that situation. Now, my thought process is, instead of grabbing a gun, why don't we deploy mental health professionals out with them? Why don't we get other methods put in place so this could stop happening? But we can't always blame the police officers, especially in the Makaya case, when this is their training. Shouldn't we be mad at the lawmakers and trying to push for reform and change? Well, I think it's twofold because the, 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 we, can, we can do both. You know, we can do both. But who's doing the action? The police officers. And the police officer has a choice to make when they step on any scene, okay? They have a choice to make when they step on any scene. Specifically in regards to George Floyd, George, the police were called to that scene because the store clerk called the police because he thought that George Floyd was committing fraud. George Floyd, I believe, gave him a $20 bill and he thought it was fake. No, so he called case, the police. In that case, 100% wrong. But the reason why I keep going back to Micaiah mm -hmm. because he didn't have all the information. He just walked no, up, didn't. tried to defuse the situation, and basically mm -hmm. seen someone with the knife. And mm -hmm. the close proximity, what was he supposed to do when he sees someone in the action with the knife, their hand mm -hmm. cocked back and about to stab? And mm -hmm. I feel like he's getting, people are saying he should go to jail, but in mm -hmm. this case, I kind of feel bad for the. I feel bad for the family. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. No kid should ever be killed like that. Her her emotions probably were high. She was upset. She was just pissed and, and basically just acting off emotion. But then I also feel for him too because he was put in a position where he was forced to shoot when he probably didn't even want to. And I mm -hmm. think sometimes we give all cops a bad rap. <laughs> When in reality, in that in that specific case, I don't think he had an option to do either or. Because if he didn't act, it would have been a problem. And if he did, mm -hmm. it still would have been a problem. So in that mm -hmm. case, what do we do with situations like that? Do we still protest against the cop when I mm -hmm. don't feel like he was at fault? I feel like mm -hmm. the system was at fault, but not him based on him carrying out his job duty. He's a part of the system, he though. Caught. Huh? He's a part of the system. It comes with the job. He's a part of the system. The system didn't murder so Micaiah. He murdered Micaiah. So you think he murdered he's somebody at the at the at the here? So I think we're talking about a lot of things. First of all, he murdered somebody, police officer or not. If he was not a police officer and he killed somebody, then the discussion would be he needs to be arrested. He needs to go to jail because he murdered somebody, right? The okay, difference. Hold on, but let me, the okay, only let me difference is that he has a badge. 
I so don't feel. Let me play devil's mm -hmm. advocate. So what I'm saying is, if he didn't shoot mm -hmm. and she stabbed and killed the other person, mm -hmm. then what would be the take? Then he would still be in trouble because he failed to act. But, so that's what I'm saying. But he was again, we're talking about where... several different things because that's the system that is, he would be in trouble because of the system too, you know? So there are a lot of, I don't have all the answers, but I'm just very clear on the fact that the 15 year old should not have been murdered. No, she there are other have. things that should, that can be um, added to this system to change some very foundational errors and issues. You know, I'm calling them errors because I think they are, they're wrong, but some foundational issues that lead to situations like this. Now, when you're um, in law enforcement, you know, you don't, when you're a police officer, and so I, I always, Okay, so I was a probation officer for a decade, okay? And when you're in law enforcement, you do not have to, uh, when you're a sworn officer, your life doesn't have to be in danger for you to shoot someone or taser someone or arrest right. someone or take someone down. Because your job as an officer is to protect the community. So if you see a community member and their life is in danger, then it's your job to protect them. And protecting them means all these different tools that you've been equipped with, this training that you've been equipped with, right? So it's very, you know, it's very hard for, I feel like, us to have this conversation because, again, it's a system. The police are trained on this system. They don't care about if somebody died. It's a part of their job duty. He probably got accolades when he went back to the station. Like, oh, yes, good call, good shot, good shot, you know? Maybe not because he killed a black person, but because he understood his assignment and did what needed to be done. That is where my problem lies because everybody doesn't need to be shot and killed. No, absolutely. I'm not a, now, I'm not against, don't get me wrong, because if somebody attacked me and I have a gun, I'm shooting the kill because you need to get up off me. I'm leaving alive, okay? So I just think that systematic things need to be changed so that every day we're not hearing about a person being more murdered and more specifically it's us being murdered because we're not if this was a 15 year old white girl they would be protesting they would have his job they would be talking about she had mental health issues or she was depressed she's in the foster care sense system and hold these other people accountable that were attacking her our lives are not seen as valuable so it automatically, I feel like, goes to, oh, it was a black girl. She was in foster care already. She had a knife in her hand, and she lunged at somebody. So let me no. ask you this. She should not have been murdered. Do you feel like he, he, he should be fired based on a system that they created for him, for him to operate in? Do I feel like he should be fired? I think that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if he should be fired or not. I feel like it's wrong that he killed a 15-year-old girl. It's definitely wrong. I don't feel like he should be re rewarded for that. I don't feel he like should he should be, be celebrated for that. But my thing is, I think there's just, just as we were saying before, laws that need to be implemented to, instead of pulling a gun, we need other alternatives to stop just always killing people. But in definitely. a situation like that, because if the girl ended up killing the other person, the other parties would have felt the same way. Well, you allowed my daughter or my friend or my sister, or whoever, my mm -hmm. mother to get killed and you failed to act. It mm -hmm. would have been the same situation regardless mm -hmm. of what he did in that specific situation. Definitely. I mean, everybody's not going to win. That's in any situation, whether we're talking about murder or not, whether we're talking about shooting or not. It, somebody has to lose in every situation, you know? Um, so I don't, you know, and I'm not saying that if it was somebody else in that situation that had, if, if Micaiah had um, ended up connecting and stabbing the other young lady that she was lunging at, that would have been just as sad, you know? That would have been just as terrible and traumatic, okay? The police officer had a job to do, but they police officers know that. People, law enforcement personnel know that when they sign up for the job. I mean, some of them know. Some of them find out at court. Some of them find out on the job, I think, that, you know, I, I might have to, you know? Um, so that's something that 
you know, th that individual has to grapple with yeah, and make their own decisions and decide, you know, what side they're going to be on, you know, because although it may have been looked down on him by the police department of force, you know, to uh, you deploy another method, a taser and tasers, they only go about 10 feet. It, from the video, it appears that he was about 10 feet from her. It also doesn't look like he ran. It looks like he just planted and shot. So, you know, there are a lot of things that could have happened, you know? Um, there are rubber bullets, you know? He could have tried to, like, just go hands-on and be physical with her. He could have tried to de-escalate the situation. We don't know because we weren't there. We're just seeing a video. But there's this rule in law enforcement where when a fellow law a fellow law enforcement officer is you know on trial or being judged for like an incident that happened it's you know you have to think with the mind of you know somebody with his reasonable or same level of training and experience right so any another police officer with his same level of training and experience is probably going to agree that he did the right thing maybe somebody with a little more experience would have been to verbal verbally de-escalate the situation you know, um, by talking it down. But we don't know because we weren't in it. A lot of times looking from the outside in, you know, we're like, oh, well, he should have did this. They should have did that. They. But when you're in it, you know, you're just thinking, it's like muscle memory. You're trying to think of, okay, what was I trained to do? What was I told to do? On you know, toes. and again, that's why I said that it needs to be changed systematically, you know, and not shoot to kill, not murder, not that be something that's held like, you know, that's good, that's great. You know, why can't we say that's a last resort? You know, why can't we say, well, we're going to try these other methods first. We're going to, you know, and when we're responding to calls, how can we can't have, you know, other personnel respond with us, a social worker, a mental health therapist. You know, that's, that's what I think, you know. Um, question. I'm not here question. to say whether he should lose his job or not. I don't know. I feel like that's something that has to do with him as an individual. Uh, because again, it, it, he knew what he was getting into, and I just feel like this backlash that is coming with it, it's, it's the job. It's the job. It could be so any of us. He could have been a black so officer that so shot let a white person. This. Let me ask you this, because I want to play devil's advocate again. Because we're focused on the officer, right, and the mm -hmm. laws, which we should be. But when do mm -hmm. we actually hold the adults there? Because I didn't know. You just told me something I didn't know. I thought she was arguing oh. with other teenagers. When do we hold oh. the adults? Yeah, watch the video. Well, I won't say watch the video again because it, it's traumatic. But there were adults in that video standing against so, the car. But do we hold the adults there accountable as well? I think they definitely should be held accountable because I'm trying to figure out why the foster care mother was letting a fight go on. Why she was allowing this argument to go on. Because I'm going to tell you what that made me think when I read the article. And I'm like, okay, so you invited these young women over to celebrate your birthday and then they start getting on this 15 year old about cleaning the house. I feel like it's safe to say that every black person then probably been in that situation. Your older cousin come over, your older sister come over, your auntie come over and they like, why ain't you do this, this and that? You know, you need to be doing the laundry, blah, 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 blah. Okay. That creates a hostile situation, you know? Because if you already don't want to do it, and now you got three people, two people telling you, you know, you already probably kind of got an attitude. They didn't live there, and they're telling this young woman what to do. She's already a foster child, so she's not in the home with her family. She already feels like an outsider. It's a lot going Why on. Why was the foster care mother allowing this altercation to unfold? De-escalation should have happened there. Foster parents are supposed to have trainings that help them to de-escalate situations, too. Hold on. So because Chris said, it sounds like Chris, they was trying to hold on. beat Chris up on the said, girl, whoop her, you know? Chris is saying they would have whooped her ace if she had got in the middle. Like, and what do you mean? Because I think I so know. many times. I don't know about all that. Hold on. Yeah, because so many times I feel like we quick to look at other parties instead of looking in-house. And I have a problem with that. Because I've seen a lot of people in that video, and I don't see too many people trying to de-escalate the situation. Yes, we could say it is the police job to de- It is. But at the same time, do we take accountability for what's happening around us as well? Do we step in and de-escalate the situations? Or do we always just get our phone out to have something to record? Because if exactly. there were multiple adults in that house, exactly. why are we like basically talking about what they should have done? Because it could have been prevented if they would have stopped. The police didn't even have to be called. Why did the young lady feel so unprotected, so unsafe, so in danger that she had to call the police to come and help her.
to me, that says that everybody in that house was jumping on her, whether it was verbally or physically. There was not one person in that house that had her back. Not one person in that house that at least was like, nah, we're not going to do this. She had to I call for outside help. And then that outside help say, came well, and okay, murdered well, her. Well, let me not, let's not say that they basically, because we don't know. Because I, I can understand. Uh, we, we don't have to know. I feel like we don't have to know. She called the police because, uh, just imagine, just imagine, if there's an argument happening in your household right now, and nobody does anything about it. It's going to escalate, 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 right? Until it burns out for some reason. Either because everybody gets tired of arguing, somebody take it up a notch, somebody leaves, somebody interrupts and tries to de-escalate, you know? And this has probably happened how many times? She probably already know what's up, right? She probably already knows what's up. This girl has probably been in arguments with these two people, teens or women, whoever they are before, the foster mother before, and... That's why she had the knife in her hand. That's why she called the police. Somebody who is going to harm you ain't thinking about calling the police. She was the victim. She was like, oh, I'm going to stab them, but I'm going to call the police real quick, too. No. She called but the do, police but for do help, you feel like and they took too long, and she grabbed a knife so they could stay up off her. Do you feel like education should now start, too, within our own households? in terms of what we could do to prevent this? Because that's a situation that could definitely, that could have been prevented. Absolutely. Education starts now. I mean, I talk to my children now. I've always talked to my children. You know, again, I was a, in law enforcement for 10 years. I was a probation officer and the job description is a little different, but we dealt with the same like population. Uh, we had, we had a lot of the same training um, and I was torn, you know, which is a whole other story. But even then I would talk to my children. I have very young children and I would talk to them about the cases that you know, um, like because of the cases that I got, I would talk to them about, you know, those type of scenarios, you know, like not the case itself, but like, hey, if this ever happens, this is what you need to do. I still talk to them about it. You know, I'll soon, soon I'll have a middle schooler and I'll be talking to them about, you know, hey, this is what you need to do because there are resource officers at the school and all of that, you know, and the education really starts at home. We can't allow our children to go outside of the home and figure it out by themselves. We have to prepare them because when they get in the in front of a police officer, they need to know if they what their rights are and if they can say no or not. Because usually what children are taught is to follow authority, is to listen to authority, right? So right. if you've never taught them specifically what authority looks like and, and, and what danger looks like, then they're just going to assume when they get in from a, front of a police officer that they have to do whatever the police officer says when that's not true. Right. Okay. Um, they're just going to assume, and that's for anybody. When they get in front of the teacher, they have to do whatever the teacher says. You know, and this goes beyond, you know, black people being murdered at the hands of law enforcement. This goes into all kinds of areas, sexual assault, kidnapping, human trafficking. We have to teach our children at home what to look for. And I think that a lot of times, people do not because they're scared to introduce it to their children because they don't want to cause a traumatic incident. They don't want their, they don't want to let their children know how scary the world is. But I believe we have to let our children know just how scary the world is so that they're prepared when they go out there. You know, that's what my mother did for me. And I can tell you, it saved me from a lot of situations because when it happened, I was like, oh, that's what my mom was talking about. And I was able to get myself out the situation, you know, verbalize what I need to verbalize so I could go, you know, or whatever it is I need to do. I was able to help some friends because, you know, I had been, I, I had already been spoken to about it. I had, it had already been drilled in my head. This is what you do. And when you feel prepared by your parent, by your loved one, then it's easier to do, you know, like I'm having a talk with my child right now, my oldest, and she'll be 11 next week. And I'm telling her, you know, hey, if you feel uncomfortable answering certain questions, just let the adult know I don't feel comfortable answering that. Talk to my mom. And she's like, oh, mom, that's rude. I don't want to say that. I don't want to talk to an adult like that. And I'm like, no, it's not rude. Let them know. Put it on me. It's all good. Put it on me. And I'm giving you permission to do that. Giving them that strength, giving them that support and letting them know it's good, you know, will help them in the long run. I know you think like that. I think that like that. But why aren't we pushing this in terms of education to the masses? Like we always wait for something to happen to then protest and then talk about mm -hmm. it instead of talking about, 
you know, um, mm -hmm. preventative measures, educating mm -hmm. your family mem members, educating your kids. We had a um, mm -hmm. heated conversation with um, myself and my two daughters, and mm -hmm. we were in the car, and there was a situation three years ago. No, two years ago. I was on my way to China. I was at the airport. My daughter calls me. She tells me <clears> that <throat> the police drew their guns out on her. So she's telling mm -hmm. me, like, um, they're being very combative, different things. So obviously, as a mother, I'm concerned. I'm at the airport. I'm about to um, get on a plane, and I'm about to leave. So obviously, I called the sergeant. I tried to see what's going on. He said he was going to review the body cam. So when he came out, my daughter said that her boyfriend had a BB gun on the driver's seat by her feet, right? And so when we were in the car and I was talking to her, I said, I couldn't be mad at the police. I had to be mad at you and your boyfriend. She's like, mom, you're minimizing my situation. I said, no, I'm not. Because this is the thing. If you would have got shot that night, their excuse would have been, we thought the BB gun was a gun. It was a real gun. How can I argue that, right? But if there was no gun in the car and you got shot, I could go full throttle because you didn't, they didn't have a reason to shoot you. Not to say that they should ever have a reason to shoot you, right? But even as I'm talking to my kids, I'm making them aware of, don't give a reason to get shot. And not to say that we should be saying that, but we should, because if an officer comes to your car and your boyfriend has a BB gun in your car, you are giving <clears throat> them an excuse to shoot you. And this is the problem that I have, right? And I always play devil's advocate because I look at it from both sides. We always get mad and protest, but we're not educating ourselves and our loved ones to say, there's certain things you just don't do. Why are we talking about that? Right. So I think most people don't talk about it because for, to be equipped to train others, you have to have been trained, right? To understand something, you have to know it. And I think that's a lot of the problem, especially in the Black community, uh, we all believe a different thing, you know? So we're not able to come together on one page because a lot of us are coming from broken homes or maybe we didn't have one or both parents in the home. Maybe we're victims of something ourselves. You know, maybe we were in the foster care system. There was something that somebody didn't teach us. We didn't see the example. We didn't see somebody standing up for themselves and saying, no, this isn't okay. We no, weren't no, 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 no. I'm not talking That's about That's why. So I'm we're not able to teach... When our leaders, when our leaders come and they piggyback off of it and they talk about the protests. Now, you know how long I've been trying to get my mental health program into the school districts and it's been being blocked by people of color that look like us. And that's what I'm talking about. When the resource, when the resources are there to educate, to put things in place, we don't want it. But then we want to get mad and protest and all this different stuff when these things are occurring, but there are so many preventative measures that we mm -hmm. can do before we even get to this point. I don't Definitely. expect the person that don't know to, to have these conversations mm -hmm. when they don't know any better, but a lot mm -hmm. of us do know better and we refuse mm -hmm. to do better until it's right at our front <clears throat> door. Now we want to talk about it. We should have right. been talking about right. this stuff. No, I agree. I think it still goes back to kind of what I was explaining is that we all come from like different backgrounds and stuff, right? So if you have a person who, you know, and this is what I, this is from personal and professional experience, okay? So I'm a very outspoken person. I'm very assertive. I'm high energy most times, you know? And so I'm like that through and through. That's who I am, okay? And I could I be online. It. I could be at work. I, we could be out to lunch. We could be kicking it. I could be with my kids. I could be with, you know, whatever. I'm, this is who I am all the time, okay? Some people are not like that. <laughs> Some people... Okay, one of two things. They may be vocal, vocal when they're personal with their friends and family, but when they're at work, they're a they are church mouse. Oop, I'm not going to say nothing. You know, you're a part or of the problem, they're not outspoken. Exactly. Or they're of the not problem. outspoken. And a lot of these people are people in positions to make change, but they're not making the change because they're not a squeaky wheel, you know, by nature, or because they're ignoring what the proper resource would be. Okay, and that goes into a whole other conversation. You and I know we've had experience. People are in the position to make change, but they don't because they don't want you to come in and make the change. You know, they want to keep everything under wraps so they can control it, right? I think that it's just, and this comes from, again, this is a whole other conversation, and I'm trying to stay on topic, but this comes from a long line of Black people, for one, being deprived of things 
So when we get it, we feel like we got to hold on to it. You know, we feel like it's just for us. We can't share, can't tell nobody else. That comes from slavery too. You know, them pitting us against each other. And it's just carried through generations. Okay? It's carried through generations. And so, so a lot of us have that mindset. And we're not able to collectively make change because we all have a different freaking agenda. We need to have one agenda affecting positive change within our communities and move out from there. What does that look like? You know, that looks like making sure that our people get the mental health services they need. That means making sure that our people get the resources and tools and education they need, the funding they need, the budgeting they need. You know, a lot of times we have to go outside of our community to get a shot. And it shouldn't be like that. But let's be real. So let's be 100% transparent because you work oh, in the always. community. I work in the community. And we know people that look just like us blocks us a lot of time for putting the programs so in sad. place, right? And so, so this is where, and this is why I say it has to start at home because mm. when you basically are trying to not allow a program in a school because you want to have your friend do it to get the money because it's really not about mm -hmm. the kids. That's mm -hmm. a problem for me. But Personal then I agendas. see the same people getting out here and you want to protest and do all these different things, mm -hmm. but you're not really trying to effectively change mm -hmm. the minds mm -hmm. or implement change within mm -hmm. the community. Because people are looking for personal gratification. Affecting positive change, you know, doesn't mean that you are looking to be celebrated and spotlighted. And I think that's what a lot of people are looking for. They want to be recognized for it. You know, when really they need to be putting together the best people that can get it done, you know, right. um, I think it's just, yeah, people are looking for personal gratification. Um, there are a lot of people, I, I agree with everything that you said just now, there are a lot of people who are in the spotlight in our communities and they're really not doing the work. Not doing anything. Mm -hmm. Not doing They're anything, really not doing the work. But looking but, but good. they've been in the game so long and it's clickish. Let me tell you, okay, so this is the opportunity for us to tell y'all, okay? When you get into a position to affect positive change, that's the assignment. Make sure that you're affecting positive change. That means put your personal positions and goals and stuff aside and make sure that you're affecting positive change for the community, okay? Make sure that you're linking the proper people in the community. The proper people might not be your friends. Here's a perfect example. Okay, the biggest nonprofit in a black community is the black church. The biggest nonprofit in a black community is the black church. All right. We've all been a part of black churches. What are they always doing? Raising money for the building fund. When is this building going to happen? Because they're raising money constantly, but they don't have the right people in position. It's very clicky. Okay. And this, I'm just speaking from personal experience. If you're black church, if you go to black church and it's not clicky, then cool, you know, that's fine. Okay. But from my personal experience, they put, you, you know, there are examples of people putting into, being put into the position because the pastor likes them, because, you know, the first lady likes them, not because they're qualified. People on these boards need to be qualified. People on your committee, on your hold project on, on, need to be on. qualified. Hold on. And that so, might so, not be your friend, your husband, your auntie. Because Chris just said, do y'all know <laughs> America has never had an African-American governor? So this is my thing, right? I'm not Interesting. caught up on race. So let, let's get that clear. I'm definitely America not has race. not had an... And let me fact check Hold that. on, hold on, hold on. I don't know if it's true or not. But my thing is not about who gets in position. My, my whole focus is who gets in position and do what they need to do. Because I know a whole, let me tell you something. I'm a community advocate, okay? I really dig in, y'all see social media stuff, but I'm really in real life for real trying to affect change, getting programs in the schools and different things like that. And one thing that we're talking about, the people that block us from getting and implementing the change within schools and programs are people that look just like you and me. So I don't care about the president being black I don't care about the governor being black. My only concern is whoever's in that position do the job that you signed up to do because we get caught up in color and that's where you get deceived too. You vote for the black person, but they just trying to let all their peoples get in, get the money and do absolutely nothing. I don't mm -hmm. care about your color. I care about the job that you're assigned to do and that you really are committed and passionate about doing it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so just a fact check real quick. So DeVal Lordine Patrick 
was a governor in Massachusetts from 2007 to 2015, and he's black. I'm looking at his picture right now. There's two other listed. No, there's three other listed, and those three other people don't look black. Even though I know that they don't have to look black to be black, I'm looking at their... He's saying they're controlled by whites. I think we definitely have to change our mindset of being just caught up in race and color because that's when mm -hmm. division <clears throat> comes. Because again, I'm not... I'm for everybody. Black, white, man. I'm a child of God. I'm going to let mm -hmm. y'all know that right off the bat. I am a child of mm -hmm. God. So every race, nationality, and creed are my people. I don't mm -hmm. care who's in the position. I only mm -hmm. care about the job getting done. And, mm -hmm. and it could be done by anybody. Let's make mm -hmm. that clear. Because I've seen people in all races block doors for things getting done. So I don't care about race. When are we going to mm -hmm. get things done and stop having a crab in the bucket mentality to try to stop the people that really want to get the job done? Well, that's where you and I differ because so I'm I am extremely pro-black, and that's not to say that I feel that someone of another race can't do a great job, a race or ethnicity um, can do a good job. That's not what I mean. That just means I'm for my people, and I love to see my people thrive and win. I'm also for inclusivity. Okay, I'm also for inclusivity, you know, and we have, I feel that, you know, we have to be for our specific community because that's how we're going to rise above. That's how we're going to have equity and equality and justice. If we are supportive of our communities, you know, every step of the way in every aspect, okay? And when there are government in place, systems in place, institutions in place, organizations in place, and they don't have black people on their boards, on their committees, in, in high positions of management, supervision, leadership, that lets me know that they're not an inclusive space, that they don't respect our opinions, our talents, our expertise, okay? And that lets me know that I may not be welcome there. I, you know, it, it's, this is, okay, this goes into psychological safety because it feels unsafe for me to walk okay. into a place I where I don't you, see anybody that looks like me. I want you to address me. this. I want you to address this. I agree with you 100%. I, I don't think that pro-black means that black only. I mean, okay. pro-black. I, I think pro, to me, pro-black means that we're supporting our people. And support looks like a lot of different things. We could get into that, too. Support looks like a lot of different things. But I don't think that pro-black means only black. I think it means that we support ours first. That we support ours always, you know? It doesn't mean only to me. Because this is the thing. When you start saying pro-black and only black, it, it, we got to get out of that, too. Because if you say only black, then you only, you, you only want to see it's black good, dollars. Chris. Then how are you going to for adding to the conversation. Because uh, corporate America doesn't only see white dollars. I think black dollars is what drives or pushes corporate America. Or white America. Oh, it definitely so does. And I wish I could pull the stats up on that, it now, that, but it's going to take really me too long to find that doc. That way of thinking because mm -hmm. I want everybody's dollars. I don't right. want the dollars so, that just look like mine. There's a duality to this because, you know, yeah, we. it doesn't mean that we're only looking for black people to spend money with us, right? It means we want everybody money, but we're going to support black businesses. Like, as for me and my home, listen, I'm telling you, if I'm looking for something, I'm looking for a black creator of it first. A black, if I'm looking for a service, I'm looking for a black person who provides that service first. If I'm looking for, you know, a product, I'm looking for a black person who creates that product first, okay? And that's my first order of business, all right? And then after that, I'll look at quality of service. I'm not just going to go to okay, a hold on, they hold black, on. but friend, I'm going to start there. That's you're where I start. Friend, but I'm, I'm going to have to call you out on it. But isn't that okay. the same thing that we get mad at when we say white people do? But I'm not against nepotism. Oh, so you're I'm okay. not a, Okay. I'm not against, yeah, no. That's what other people do, and they should. What what I feel like the problem is, is we don't. Asia put, community put theirs on, okay? They ain't got no qualms about it. They not embarrassed about it, and they not gonna act like they don't do it. They come here with a mission, and I feel like that's what we need to do. We don't do it, because we're so busy pitting ourselves against each other that we have, we're, we're, not, we're not being as powerful as we can. Okay, the Asian community, as an example, 
And they come over here and start businesses and they hire their own, whether that's family or people that are their same ethnicity. And then they build on that and then open another business and everybody go work at that business. Well, I think it's only you know, we don't do that. that you are going to look in-house first. But my thing is, this we're is where the problem it, comes though. in. Cause we're people not committed all... to it, though. What do you mean? No, this is the problem that comes in. It's people, a system. Because... It is a system we have to follow. We use it as a preference. What I'm saying is, of course, if I own my own company, I'm going to hire my daughter. I'm a, I agree with that. But I also believe I'm not going to give you the job if you don't, you're not the right person for the job if you don't know what you're doing. And that's where a lot of unprofessionalism comes in. People get of with people not. or hire people because of the connection, but doesn't mean they're the best person for the job. Exactly. But there is more than one or two black people, <laughs> you know? So, like, this is this is what I'm saying. So... I think that we're on the same page. You know, like if I'm looking to hire somebody, I'm I'm going to start black first because I'm trying to build bl the black community, right? And the black dollar and all of that stuff. So if I come across one, two, three, seven black people that applied for the position and they're not qualified, that doesn't mean oh, I'm just going to give up because black people, they ain't qualified. I'm tired. I'm going to go get a white person, an Asian person, an Indian person, or whatever, right? That's not what that means. That means I'm going to shop around till I find the black person that is qualified for me. And I'm also not saying that I won't do business with someone of another race or ethnicity, but I'm starting black first. That's it. And I'm showing love to black first. And I feel like that's where we fail because we just write it off. We write off our own people as unprofessional, as unqualified. You know, we going, we looking over here at the dollar signs to somebody who already has it or we feel like is glitter and gold. And we miss up opportunities to support our own community, which creates a lot of uh, frustration in our own community. And it's, again, it's a system, but we use it as a preference. We're like, well, oh, I'd rather work with this person over here because they got it, you know, they got everything going on. I ain't got to worry about this. We insert stereotypes. Oh, I know they probably got good credit. I know they probably are, are qualified. They went to this school or that school. Everybody started somewhere. Everybody needs an opportunity. Excuse me. You know, and if we're not giving those opportunities to our own community, we can't build. We cannot build. We're stuck at the foundation because we can never build. We can never, we can never build. It's always somebody, you know, coming in and I feel like messing the system up. Asian communities, as an example, have a system, okay? They come over and get their business started. They business oriented. I respect it. And they hire their family. They hire their own. And that's that. They're not worried about how nobody feels about it because they have a system that they're working. And they probably have people that work for them in their own race and community ethnicity that's probably not qualified. Do they care? No, you about to work because we need some work look, over here, yeah, I, I, you know, I and we're going to build it what up. You're saying, but at the end of the day, like, I don't know. I'm just, this is where we differ. We do differ in terms of because I don't just think just black, right? I, ju I just don't. I don't, right? And that's My, fine. That has to do with our upbringing, you know. And your so and the other thing is is like your culture is a lot different from mine too, right? So like you were raised differently than me, and that's okay. There's there's no problem with it. I don't think anybody's right or wrong in this, you know. No, 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 no. It's because all, you have good there points. Is no, there is there is no right or wrong. But I want because I'm looking, I'm I'm actually listening to you and reading the comments at the same time. And my thing is when we when we take on that same mindset, and I'm just saying to you, this is to the comments. When it's us, 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 we, 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 be, we then become what we don't like that's being done to us. And, and if you ever exactly. want anything to change, you have to be the reflection yep, that systematic. you want to see. And it's so systemic, that's what, I mean, mm -hmm. what'd you say? I was just correcting myself. I was just saying, yes, it's systemic. Yeah. So I always want to be fair and <laughs> impartial to everyone, because if I want to see change, I have to be the change. Right. My kids already know. I have a company. We have companies. But that doesn't mean I'm going to give you the job. Show me that you deserve the job. Because this is my thing, right? And y'all can say I'm crazy or whatever. But if something happens to me, I want to be able to know that my kids can build from the ground up. I don't believe in just giving it to you. So if I won't do that to my own kids, I'm definitely not about to do it for a stranger. Show me that you deserve it. And, and people may disagree with, well, that's what they do with their people. It doesn't matter what somebody else does. I can only do what I need to do for me because I want to make sure that my kids are equipped mentally and prepared. And that's what I talk about when I say it starts at the home. 
Could I have mm -hmm. called the sergeant? And I did call the sergeant and make a big fuss. And oh, they put the guns out. Once my daughter told me that her boyfriend had a BB gun in the car, there was no more argument because I wanted my daughter to understand that you made a conscious decision to get in the car with your boyfriend to have a BB gun in the car because I want you to think. It's not about what other people do. It's not about what other people get away with because if everybody jump off the building, are you going to jump off of it too? So I'm always pushing, be what you want to see. And if, and if you're talking about division and being divisive, don't get mad when they're talking about it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there's two, there, there's two parts to that because definitely I feel like correct in private but be a common, you know, uh, a partnership in the forefront, you know, of everybody, you know. So I definitely agree because I would have called the sergeant and still raised hell because there is a difference. There's a difference in how they treat white people and how they treat black people. And we're talking about law enforcement or I'm talking about law enforcement right now, just in regards to uh, Dr. Miles' last comment, you know, with what happened with her daughter. If you guys missed that, make sure you watch the replay of this. But um, I would have done the same thing. Talk to my daughter about her decisions, her boyfriend's decisions, what happened and how they can prevent, you know, it from happening again and what could have happened. Talk about all that for sure. And I also would have called I spoke to the police department, you know, um, about their actions because they, if we don't, I feel like if we don't stay on their necks, then it leaves them room to feel like they I can, did, you know, I keep doing want, stuff okay, or whatever. I did talk to the sergeant, right? But I didn't want my daughter to think like, I'm going to just go off on this. No, I'm going to hold you accountable too. And I think yeah. we don't hold our own accountable. We don't. It's like, okay, we're going to protest you. But when are we going to hold you accountable for putting yourself in that situation? Should it, should it have, have happened? No. But it was a lot of people in the Makaya, Makaya. situation that mm -hmm. could have prevented it before it even got to that point. That's true. That, that's true. It, it, it could have been prevented. But what you did five minutes ago, you know, it, it, it does not have to do with what a stranger's decision is 10 minutes later. You know, everybody has their own decision. Everybody has their own decisions. So I agree that it starts at home, that there are a lot of people in that situation with Micaiah Bryant who could have de-escalated the situation, who could have prevented the unjust murder of Micaiah Bryant, you know, and there's, a, there's some systemic things there. They should have called the social worker, you know, to help if, if, if she was out of well, hand, which I don't believe she we was. Both know but when the officer worker, arrived, he be, had a choice to make A social too. worker's not just going to be on speed dial and just come because they called. Let's be, we both know that. Well, they're, they're not, but that's a systemic thing, too, because they're supposed to. They're supposed to, but our social workers, at least, I don't know where y'all are tuning in from, but out no. here in California, Southern California specifically, they're, o they're overworked, underpaid. Yes. They yes. have too many cases, yes. Yes. and they can't respond to everything. But they're supposed to be able to. That's a whole other systemic problem. Well, this is a real right. good dialogue. So look, I got about five more minutes. This is a good conversation, <laughs> and I need you to send it to me because I need you to send me the recording. I will definitely send you the recording. So this is I don't my have good, all of it. This is my good friend, y'all. I, I know her views. And and this just, just goes to show you, too. Like, some of our views differ, but we have so many similarities and commonalities. And this is why I always tell people, too. I love to be around people. Now, I don't want no negative or drama-type field people because we, we will never get along because right. that's just not my energy. Right. But I mm -hmm. love to be around people that think different from me because it gives me a whole different perspective um, a way of thinking and I feel like if you're around the same people same. that think talk do everything like you all the time when are you growing yeah, and so a exactly. lot of our views differ but I love her because she brings a different perspective and sometimes she makes me think and I'm pretty sure on her end same. as well and so mm -hmm. you should always be surrounding yourself with people that have different views as you not that you always have to agree but just having mm -hmm. a different perspective and that's why when I look at shootings and different things I don't just look at it from the black person being shot perspective. I look at it from the cop. Um, one of the, another conversation I have with my daughter is just like, you know, African-Americans want to make it home safely. So the police officers, you know, they Absolutely. walk into situations too, that they don't know what's going to happen. And so I never want it Absolutely. to be a situation where it's, Oh, we don't like police officers or F12. No, mm -hmm. I love 12 because the ones that do it right. I'm calling the police. If you break up in my house, Listen, say it again. I'm you break up in my house. If you break you up in my house, rape me, and so we you do something to me and my family. I'm mentality. calling. <laughs> we got to get out of that mentality as the police officers 
are um, our enemies. Because at the end of right. the day, I feel like even with change, I always say this, you cannot, you cannot referee or talk from the, when, when there's a basketball game going on, the, the players are not listening to the people in the stands. You're a spectator. It's the same mm -hmm. thing in the world. If you want to affect change, the things we should be saying is telling our sons, go be police officers, go be lawyers, go be these different things so you can get in the game and play and make the change. Don't just complain from the sidelines. That's why I say my friend and I, we're really in the community. Really, This ain't just social media. We're really out here being right. effective and making the change. So I Absolutely. have a problem with people that run their mouth and got a lot of say, lot to say, but they're not in the game. But ain't doing you nothing. Be quiet if you're not a participant. If you're Listen. not willing to participate, then don't say anything at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, just as my last little bit, I, I feel like the police system, the law enforcement system needs to be totally redone. That's how I feel. I don't think we can change it just kind of trying to insert where it's at right now. I feel like the whole thing needs to be redone because even though, like I said before, I was in law enforcement and I felt like I really wanted to make a change, you know, but getting in there, you know, all kin folk ain't skin folk. So getting in there, you might be the only one trying to affect change. And there's a, there's a department of 500 people, you know, that's hard when you don't have anybody support rallying with you you know um, when you're the only one speaking up being the squeaky wheel and the whistleblower um, and that's a lot of pressure you know um, and there's a lot of systems in place that make it to where specifically black people and people of color cannot win you know and we're going to be targeted we didn't talk about Dante Wright but he was pulled over because he had an air freshener in his hanging in his mirror you know why is that a law why is it illegal? Hold on, you Chris, have an air freshener really in your window. Was, Chris is killing me. You know, the what is going on? Chris, I really want you to try to change your perspective of thinking because as long as Half you work, have hate like home. that in your heart, hate me take, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like the energy you give is the, always the energy you give back. And so that's why I yeah. don't breed negativity because I know if I put it out there, it's going to come back. And you just yeah. have, like, I don't know your experience. And a lot of times our, our framework, our mindset is based on our experiences. And just because you may have come across a few people like that does not mean everybody is like that. I have a family member that's a police officer. I know police officers. I have friends that are police. Everyone is not like that of all different races, I'm telling you. So don't just, yeah. you know, we can't get into this mindset that all police officers are bad. It's equivalent to saying when racist people say all black people are ghetto. <laughs> It's the same exact mm -hmm. thing. We have to right. change our way of thinking. Yeah. And if you we want do. life to change, you want the world to mm -hmm. change, be the change that you want to see mm -hmm. because it all starts with you. And, and some, if, listen, Chris, if anybody Chris, on this live, Chris, if you're going to be a Chris, police officer, okay. make sure you're a police Chris. officer. That's Let me tell you this. What? She said, Chris, I don't know if Chris is a girl guy because Chris can go either way. <laughs> they said, I'm from the hood hood. Chris, so am I. But I had to change my way of thinking. You know, being from the hood don't mean you can't change. You talking about? Yeah, I don't think it's any wrong, anything wrong with being a law enforcement officer, but it's something wrong in any job with you just going along with whatever's happening. You know, so I fault the people that if you're if you're a police officer or thinking about if you're an aspiring police officer or whatever, you know, you have to be ready to get up in there and 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 speak when it's probably hard right and be a whistleblower and not go along with things that are wrong and illegal that you see happening you know and long story short it's part of the reason i left because i was always getting talked to because they was like kiona you always complaining about this and and i'm gonna continue to and it was just you know i had to turn a new chapter i had to open a new chapter in my life and i took that knowledge that i have with me and now i affect positive change within my community with that skill set as well. You know, so I think that this was a great conversation. I got I do have to Tell roll, but um, that, though, I think it was a great conversation. She's all about affecting change, positivity and all that. So so tell them where they can, where where they can find you at. So of course you can follow me on here at Empowered Realtor. I have a personal professional development company. It's called Positive Women Meetup LLC. We focus on women empowerment. I am a professional speaker. So if you'd like to book me, then Go ahead and DM me and I'll send you the link to do so. Make sure you got your budget ready, all right? Because you got to pay me, okay? Um, I'm also the newly, um, I'll be sworn in in about another two months or so. 
Um, I'm one of the vice presidents for the Riverside, California section of National Council of Negro Women. I'm also the president of the Black Alumni Chapter at University of California, River Riverside. Again, affecting positive change within our community. We're not just talking about it. We're really out here doing it. Um, so that's where you can find me. Follow me on here, Empowered Realtor, or follow me at Positive Women Meetup. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Thank you guys for tuning in. I thought it would be a great discussion. Um, it was. You guys be blessed. <laughs> and as I always say, continue to break cycles. Now, you got to walk me through recording this thing because I have no idea how to close it. Okay, so listen very carefully, okay? Because I didn't even get to record. Man, that beginning was very good. I was going, I was going in. Had some good points. Okay. When you x out to leave it's gonna ask you if you want to save it press save video so it will save it to your phone not just upload okay, okay. save video and Got then it. after you save it after you save it you can also put it on igtv but you want to save it to your phone so Got move it. slow because it go by quick move slow Got and it. look at all the options because they keep changing how it looks but yeah Got save it. it and then send it to me i definitely will Hey, Dwayne from Riverside. Like I said, you guys have a great time. I thought it was a good conversation, and we'll probably be doing this more. You guys take care. Stay blessed.